Thank you all for coming. Thank you everyone for being here, for supporting us, for, I just, I thank everyone for, for everything. Um, I wanted to thank also um, CMSRI, who are our sponsors, one of our key sponsors. The other one is my organization, A Voice for Choice, so I'm not going to thank myself, but I really thank CMSRI. Um, they are they are supporting a lot of Chris's work, um, and I really feel so strongly, and it's part of the reason I asked Chris to come and give two speeches and give our uh, keynote speech tonight, because I truly believe that the whole piece of aluminum, or as he says, aluminium, how I say aluminium, <laughs> until I moved to the States, but I truly believe that this is a key, key, key piece in the future, um, and especially in the future of vaccines, um, and, and overcoming where we are and where we're going with vaccines. Um, so I'm honored to have Chris here. I'm thankful that he came from the UK all the way. Um, he took time out of his career, out of his teaching and all the rest of it to be here. Um, so he, for those of you who weren't there this, this afternoon, he got an amazing speech this afternoon that kind of set the stage for this one. Um, he's a biologist. He is at the University of Kiel, um, studied through in the, in the UK, in Scotland, University of Stirling. Um, his big, he is, I would say, the aluminum researcher of our time. And, you know, he, he mentioned today that we're living in the aluminum, aluminium age. Um, and I truly just, the, the research he's doing is such an integral part of what needs to be done. And, you know, interestingly enough, it's as with a lot of the stuff that I have and I touch, um, is trying to, and, and I think many people in this room touch, is trying to be shut down by pharmaceutical companies, by other big, big corporations. Um, and so I think, you know, we need to keep supporting all of this research that needs to be done um, in order to, to get the truth out there. So thank you, Chris, for coming. Um, I really appreciate it, and we can't wait to hear what you have to say. Okay, thank you. I'm going to plug the movie. I, meant, I brought it up here, and I'm holding on to it. Injecting Aluminum is the new Cinema Libre movie on aluminum. Um, it's an amazing movie. We have them for sale. Um, if you'd like to get them afterwards, you can unwrap them. Chris, I'm sure, would be happy to sign them. He's in it. It's an amazing movie if you don't have it. Um, I can, you can get one after, the, after his talk. Okay. I, I have very little to do with this film. However, the film is important because it tells a story about a disease which is actually caused by not only aluminium, aluminum, but an aluminium adjuvant in vaccines. So this is a disease that was first identified by a great friend of mine, Roman Gerardi, in Paris. And it is, without question, caused by aluminium adjuvants. And it's a, it's a rather nice film, beautifully produced, and it tells a very good story. And there's a small cameo appearance by myself, but that is <laughs> irrelevant to the film. My great friend Romain is the star of that film, and his beautiful work in identifying a disease is the star of that film. So, unfortunately, you got me once again. But at least now, I've had a few drinks. <laughs> You've had a few drinks. And so we can perhaps enjoy this session a little bit more than the afternoon session, where I probably only gave you a little bit of doom and gloom about how we're all going to die from aluminium poisoning. <laughs> but it's actually not true. There is hope, and the hope will come in the next few minutes in my talk. Listen, because of the surroundings that we're in, I encourage you just to stand up or shout if you want to interrupt, because it's an informal part of the evening and we should all enjoy it. So don't treat it specifically as a formal lecture. We'll go through it. I will talk. If you want to say something and interrupt me, just feel free to do so. Possibly they want you to come to the microphone anyway because they are filming this, but, but do feel free to do so. 
So, living safely and healthily in the aluminium age, the aluminium age. Because we are all experiencing the aluminium age, and that possibly means that everybody in this room could be healthier than they are. Because if you have aluminium in your body, that means that you are expending energy dealing with it, because it is biologically reactive. So it means that the energy that your body is spending being robust and countering the possible biological effects of aluminium means that that energy should be being used elsewhere. So having as little aluminium in your body as is possible, bearing in mind you know, the sort of provisos I talked about earlier, and I've already had my shot of aluminium in the wine that I'm drinking this evening and I haven't worried about it, we have to you know, find that fine balance. I think, I hope, that my research has found that fine balance and that's what I'm going to talk to you about this evening. Okay, so this is the bad news that we talked about, isn't it, earlier? The different ways in which the aluminium age may be impacting upon human disease. And you look up there, many of you will relate to different aspects of that. Uh, this evening we'll, we're going to actually do a little bit about, in particular, uh, multiple sclerosis, which is, uh, again, uh, something that we are researching uh, quite significantly with respect to aluminium. Interesting that multiple sclerosis and aluminium might be linked, but it's an autoimmune disease and uh, I think you've already grasped the potential connection between vaccination, vaccination with aluminium adjuvants and autoimmune conditions. So it might not be a surprise to find out that multiple sclerosis may well be something that aluminium is impacting upon. Oh, so here we are. This is Aluminium Man. I was at, I organized meetings called the Keel Meetings on Aluminium. And they have been every two years since 1995. And at one meeting, <laughs> back in, I think about 2005, somebody from the audience called me Mr. Aluminium. And that was the first time that I'd heard this. But apparently, many people had already been calling me Mr. Aluminium and I never knew about it. And I took that as a term of affection and I still take it as a term of affection. <laughs> so whether this is me or not, I don't know. But if there is a problem, we're going to try and solve it. So, there is a simple answer to this question. And I'll explain to you why in a second. But to bring the answer right to the beginning, it's a simple thing called a mineral water. Are you hearing me properly now? Yeah. But it's not any mineral water. A mineral water which is rich in the element silicon. When you drink a silicon rich mineral water, you are able to excrete aluminium from your body. And now I want to explain to you why and I want to give you the research which proves that or documents that. So this is potentially a simple and non-invasive way to get aluminium out of your body. Well, to test whether or not getting aluminium out of your body makes you feel better in the first instance, makes you healthier in the first instance. And if you have a condition which might be aluminium related, whether it impacts upon that condition. Why silicon rich mineral waters are not so called silicon or silica supplements will protect you. Please do not take offense at the next slide. I will explain what I mean. There are literally 
tens if not hundreds of so-called silicon or si silica supplements that you can buy from your health food store or online, wherever you choose to shop. Some of these products actually advertise themselves using my research, the research from my group. But there is a really significant difference between these products and the silicon which we find in a silicon rich mineral water. These products, and I only put a few of them on the, here, but you will recognize some of them I'm sure, these are just sand in a bottle. Silica is sand. These are sand in a bottle. Now, does that mean that taking one of these does not help you? No, it doesn't. They may provide some sort of benefit to you, but are they helping to remove aluminium from your body? The answer is no. And I'll explain why. Well, essentially, the reason why is, in a silicon-rich mineral water, the form of the silicon is something called silicic acid. It's a really simple molecule. It's a silicon atom surrounded by four OH groups. The closest molecule to it is water, actually. It's incredibly similar in many respects to simple water. It's a neutral molecule. It almost has no chemistry at all. It has no interactions with any known metals other than one. It only interacts with itself at very high concentrations when it forms silica. And that's it. It has no organic chemistry. It is one of the simplest molecules on the earth. It is also arguably the most important molecule on the earth. Possibly water is more important. You know, NASA is always looking for water aren't they? But maybe they should be looking for silicic acid in terms of whether or not there's life on other planets. But anyway, it's a very, very simple molecule, but in my understanding of it, it's the superstar of all molecules. Why is that? You know, I, my PhD was not dissimilar to anybody else's, I guess, in that you spend, so a PhD is three years of postgraduate research in the United Kingdom. The first year you spend getting drunk in the pub, <laughs> the sec and, and being, you know, bravo about being a PhD student, trying to attract the girls and things like this. <laughs> the second year is you realize you, ha you actually need to do some work. And then the third year, if you're lucky, you find out something. And I was lucky, because in my third year, I found out that what we knew and what my research was about was why are fish dying in acid lakes? So acid rain, which as perhaps some of you have heard of, was, was and actually remains a significant problem in different areas of the world. And it means that you get the acidification of lakes and rivers and you get the acidification of catchments, and you get fish dying, and you get forests dying. But none of that was due to the acidity. It was all due to the fact that once an environment becomes acidified, it releases the aluminium from its very inert stores, where it would never have normally been released before, because the pH, the acidity, was never low enough. And all of a sudden, the aluminium that was never biologically available, as I explained earlier this afternoon, becomes biologically available, and fish start to die, and trees start to die. And my PhD was all about understanding why they die, the toxicity of aluminium, why is it toxic, and how do you protect against it? And again, just really by pure chance, by throwing a number of different possible 
solutions against the toxicity of aluminium, I came across a relationship with silicon. And I was able to show, well, let me go back slightly. I worked in this sort of enclosed environment, a constant temperature room, where I had tanks set up and small salmon living in these tanks. And the worst thing was that I used to have, I, I would expose them to aluminium. I would come in either in the middle of the night or the next morning, and when I opened the door, and it was one of these big doors that had this big massive sort of airlock on it, you open the door, and oh, there was this smell. I, I, can, I can remember this smell absolutely now. It was the smell that my fish had died. I knew that when I looked in my tanks, I was going to see my fish lying, most of them dead, in the water. They'd been killed by the aluminium. This was a horrible thing for me. I, I remember it so much. So then I had this, I did this little bit of chemistry, which suggested that if I managed to increase the amount of silicon in the water, then perhaps that could be protective. And so one sets up the experiment, puts it all together, goes away down the pub, comes back in the morning and opens the door, it smells of roses. There's no smell. My fish are all alive. They've still got the same amount of aluminium, the same low pH, but we've added some silicon to the water and the fish are all alive. Silicon protects against the toxicity of aluminium. We even got published in Nature. Nature is like considered to be the academic journal. It's the first and the last time I was published in Nature. <laughs> my first paper in my academic life was in Nature, and it's the last time I published in Nature. Once they knew who I was, then they started to, you know, this, this man's dangerous. However, we could take this concept now. We now have something which we know protects against the toxicity of aluminium in a fish. And I'm thinking to myself, well, it protects against aluminium toxicity in a fish. Why not in everything else? Why not in humans? And that's been the story of my academic life. And one thing we were able to do, and I think I might have mentioned this earlier, I'm not sure, but in 2006, is to put this into practice. Can we use silicon, and again we're talking about silicon in a mineral water, so we're talking about this thing called silicic acid, the silicon atom surrounded by four OH groups. Could we use that in some way to protect people with Alzheimer's disease from possible aluminium toxicity? And if we could do that, the only way we could do that was, first of all, to show that by getting people with Alzheimer's disease to drink a silicon-rich mineral water, that we could get aluminium out of their body. And that's what we tried to do in this study. Is it working? Yeah. In this study here, with this particular type of mineral water. The result was a success. I think it's on here. No, not yet. This is a little bit of what I've already told you, so you don't even need to think about it. It's way too complicated for this time of night, having had one or two aluminium lace drinks. <laughs> but this is the chemistry that I discovered, inverted commas, with respect to silicic acid. So I mentioned that silicic acid has no chemistry, but of course it has chemistry with aluminium. It reacts with aluminium to form what we call a hydroxyaluminosilicate. And I've spent most of my academic life showing what this chemistry is. And you know, to the extent we now have this chemistry in the textbooks. So it is accepted as chemistry that was not known before. Indeed, just last year, not only have we been able to delineate and identify the particular chemistry, 
But that, those bits of the chemistry which were completely inaccessible to bench chemistry, we had to be able to demonstrate them in silico using computational studies. Could we use computational studies to prove that the very earliest stages of hydroxyluminate silicate formation would occur? And yes, we could. So we've identified something beautiful and unique, and of course, all we did is make an identification. This is something which has, which has meant this chemistry is the reason why we are here today. This is the chemistry that kept aluminium out of living things for the entire time of biochemical evolution. This is how important this chemistry is. You will be sleeping with me telling you about this, but this is the major excitement in my life, believe it or not. <laughs> so this is important. A healthy volunteer who is not so far from you right now drank this product, Volvic, on two separate Sunday mornings. Got up in the morning, had no breakfast, drank a liter and a half of the silicon-rich mineral water in this period here. And then this individual, you may know, collected their urine over the rest of the day and measured the aluminium content. And this is what that person found. A peak in the urinary aluminium excretion and then dropping back over time. So drinking a silicon-rich mineral water enabled this healthy volunteer to remove aluminium from their body in their urine. So this was the beginning of the thesis that we could use this to treat aluminium-related diseases. So this was first reported back in 2006, where we did this with, I think it's 10 individuals with Alzheimer's disease. So the first thing we were able to show, first of all, people with Alzheimer's disease excreted quite a lot of aluminium in their urine. And then, over only five days of drinking a silicon-rich mineral water every day, we were able to show that initially they would have an increase in the urinary excretion of aluminium, and over the five days it started to fall again, as if we were removing aluminium from their body. The product was called Volvic. And you may, some of you may know that product. The company that owns Volvic is called Danone, a huge nutrition company. And to give a little story associated with this, first of all, when we did this study, I wrote to these people over and over again beforehand thinking they're going to be interested in supporting this work. Nothing. Never heard a word. Email, letters, fax. We still used faxes in those days. <laughs> Nothing. No reply. So we bought the Volvic from the supermarket, and we used it anyway, and we produced interesting results, and we published them in one of the premier journals of Alzheimer's disease. And almost the next day, I get a telephone call <laughs> from Volvic. Oh! Yeah, you've used, our, you've used our product. It's been successful. I said, yes, I have written to you many times. I get invited to Paris. What could be more lovely? Taken, you know, wined and dined. They're interested. They like it. They want to do some research. I design a study for them so that we can do a long-term study on using their product to take aluminium out of the body of people with Alzheimer's and maybe see whether we can see some benefits in those individuals. Contracts are signed between my university and Volvic, Danone. Two weeks later, I'm in my office and I receive a telephone call from my contact at Volvic. I realize when I'm on the telephone that this is no ordinary telephone call. There's some sort of conference-type call, because I can hear lots of things going on in the background. 
they never sort of appreciated, you know, I spent five years of my teenage life living in Belgium where I learned French, so I'm pretty good at understanding French. And I could hear this in the background saying in French, you know, tell him it's all over, we can't do anything with him. In other words, something happened. Volvic is part of Danone, a relatively small part of a huge company. When Danone found out that Volvic had got involved with something which suggests that aluminium might be toxic, never mind involved in Alzheimer's disease, they came on down, down on them like a ton of bricks and they pulled out of any relationship, even though we had a contract. Now, my university were not going to fight Danone for that £150,000 contract, whatever it was at the time. So we lost the money and we lost the contract. But that's the sort of scenario in which we found ourselves working. But it doesn't change the science. The science told us that if you drink a silicon-rich mineral water, you, when you have Alzheimer's disease, at least we know we can get aluminium out of the body. So what's next? We still want to see, can we improve on that? Can we show that that is possible, not just over five days, but over many weeks? And maybe, can we see any improvement in the people with Alzheimer's because they drink a silicon-rich mineral water? So then, we had the second test of this. And we were able to published this eventually in 2013, where we've got a period where they are drinking a silicon-rich mineral water for 12 weeks, and they're drinking more than a litre a day, up to one and a half litres a day. And we were able to show that in the individuals with Alzheimer's disease, not only we were able to show that over the period of 12 weeks, the amount of aluminium in their body was lowered, but even in some ways, even more exciting was the observation that in three of the 15 individuals, in just a short period of time of 12 weeks, they improved their cognitive function at a, at a clinically significant level. So three of the 15 people, within a relatively short period of time of drinking something you buy at the supermarket, and you should be drinking anyway, a silicon-rich mineral water, improved their cognitive function. So this was the beginning, for, in many ways, for us, of, the, of a, the proof of a particular concept which started back with those salmon in that temperature-controlled room that survived uh, and, 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 and actually made sure I got my PhD. So in Alzheimer's disease, this is an example of the sort of data that we have from that. But the important thing, this is simply telling you that here, this is how much uh, aluminium is excreted in the urine before these people started to drink the silicon-rich mineral water. And then, initially, the aluminium in the urine increases because we think the silicic acid liberates aluminium from the body and therefore increases in the first instance the amount of aluminium in the urine. And then over time, over 12 weeks, becomes even lower than it was initially. So we start to purge the body of aluminium. And this is, of course, the test that we want. We want to be able to provide something which over time, and 12 weeks is a very short period of time, but over time will take aluminium out of the body so that we can reduce it to as low as practical limit as possible. This has not been achieved in this study, of course. It's only 12 weeks. But... You know, funding is funding. If you, can, if you can get a project for 10, 12 weeks and that's what the funding is, that's what you do and that's what you report on. And you can see, you know, with silicic acid coming out in the urine, as soon as you start drinking the silicon-rich mineral water, you've got much more silicic acid in the urine, as you expect, and it remains at that level. This is quite important. The potential advantage of a silicon-rich mineral water over all other types of chelators, and many of you will know what chelation is, and chelation of metals from the body. Chelation is, in many ways, a real problem because it is indiscriminatory. It takes out many of the essential metals along with those that you wish to remove. 
In this instance, because this unique chemistry between an aluminium and silicon, only aluminium is affected by this. Nothing else. So it's very specific for aluminium and you will not affect the other essential metals. Similar sorts of effects. Yes? Yeah, please do. Can you use the microphone so we can hear you? Yeah. Is there any concern with too much aluminum getting into the blood, at, you know, um, so yeah. that you're experiencing toxicity? Like, do you have yeah, to... Yeah, it's a really good question. So the question is, as, so as soon as you take the silicon-rich mineral water, the reason why you've got more aluminum in your ur urine is because you've also got more aluminum in your blood because the blood is filtered by the kidney and that comes into the urine. And actually, I have had anecdotal evidence, only anecdotal, not from the actual clinical trials, of some individuals having first drunk a silicon-rich mineral water who felt a little bit unwell initially. And I've sort of said to them, right, well, look, if it continues, then stop. But if it doesn't, then this is why we think it is. So yes, I think you're right. In the first instance, you will have more aluminium immediately in the bloodstream and therefore potentially available to produce some sort of side effects. But we don't see that in the clinical trials. And I, I'm going to go on to show you some more clinical trials now where we also haven't seen it. But I have had emails from people who have told me this. And I don't doubt them. I think it's absolutely right. These might be people who are really heavily overloaded with aluminium and it's produced a real high spike in their blood and it's made them feel nauseous and, 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 and slightly ill. You know, we know, for example, with aluminium that you get spikes under all sorts of different types of situations. You get spikes with the, with the period for, in, in women. You get spikes with something a bit more drastic, things like transplants. So any sort of major surgery, you also get spikes in blood aluminium and urinary aluminium. So. Keep it informal yeah. Yeah. Do you need me to go to the mic? Yeah, I think so, because they're taping it. Yeah. So um, a follow-up question to her question is, where is the aluminium being pulled from? Does it just go as deep as the capillaries, or is it getting in the brain, pulling it out of the macrophages mm. or their neurons? Mm. So another obviously good question. And I haven't got an answer to that because this is not the type of thing we are able to study. I cannot take a brain biopsy from a living person and work out whether or not <laughs> their brain aluminium has gone down. Would I like to? Well, maybe. But, <laughs> but you're right. You know, my understanding of this, you see, in the body, more or less everything is in equilibrium with everything else. So if you shift an equilibrium one way, the equilibrium will move to compensate for that. So if you shift an equilibrium so that you're removing aluminium from the blood, then tissue aluminium will compensate for that. And then you take another silicon-rich mineral water and you remove aluminium from the blood and the tissue aluminium compensates for that. It's and like the, sweeping the floor yeah. before things fall down. And the tissue aluminium includes, I'm confident, includes the brain. But I cannot give you you know, unequivocal evidence for that. And probably that's a good thing that I cannot. <laughs> the Alzheimer's patient showing improvement indicate that it's probable? We just said that, haven't we? Right. So we said that in 3 out of 15, it might not seem like a large number, but no Alzheimer's drug has ever shown any improvement in any individual ever. <sighs> and these are drugs that we're paying billions of dollars a year to buy for people with Alzheimer's disease. A silicon-rich mineral water showed an improvement in 3 out of 15. So yes, why would someone improve? Yes, my, I would say it's because we've removed aluminium from their brain, but I don't have the evidence for that, but only the cognitive improvement. And I would like to think that if we can do a study over months and years, we would see much more than that. We would see real changes. But just to show that this is not simply something from, these are numbers, so we'll move on to a, a picture. Healthy volunteers is exactly the same. Did you want to ask a question? No, sorry, I thought you put your hand up. Okay. Healthy volunteers, it, it, everybody responds in exactly the same way. You do not wait, need to wait to have a disease before you should start drinking a silicon-rich mineral water. Drink it now. 
Get the aluminium out of your body now. Everybody responds in the same way. It's really beautiful, simple chemistry. It's this beautiful, simple chemistry which means that we have life on earth today. And you can use it to reduce the amount of aluminium in your body. So, you know, in this case we're just showing what happens over 24 hours after drinking a silicon-rich mineral water. Aluminium in your urine, you drink a mineral water and out comes the aluminium. So it works for all of us. No difference in your essential metals, iron and copper. You, are you talking about your personal septic system or your, your house septic system? <laughs> Listen, where do, you, where, where do you want it most? You want it inside here or you want it in your septic system? I know which, where, where I prefer it. So this brings us on to a study that we did on multiple sclerosis. So again, more than 10 years ago, we were interested in multiple sclerosis, but actually this study was first designed to see if we could measure the products of oxidative damage in the urine of individuals with multiple sclerosis. But as part of that, we also measured the presence of aluminium and iron in the urine. We actually could not find any differences in the, in the products of oxidative damage. Because in a multiple sclerosis, there is a strong implication of oxidative damage in the myelin and different areas of the brain. We couldn't show that, but whoa, what did we find? We find people with multiple sclerosis produce huge amounts of aluminium in their urine. But whoa, why? We didn't know. Actually, perhaps we should have known. Because when we started then to think about this and look at it, there are lots of models of aluminium intoxication in animals. So, when people try to understand why aluminium is toxic, they do it in animal models, and they produce lots of data. And nearly every time that you look at aluminium toxicity in a rabbit, a mouse, a rat, a fish, one of the things you notice is that one of the main targets for aluminium in the brain is the myelin, the myelin which is destroyed in multiple sclerosis. But no one had ever put these two together. So we do a study on MS for different reasons, and we find lots of aluminium in the urine, also a lot of iron, two complementary metals in many ways. So we needed to follow this up, and as usual, it took a long time, because not because we didn't have any good ideas, because we didn't have any money. <laughs> so you've got to find the money, you've got to find the support for it, and we did eventually. And this is something which we've just sent for review. So that was 2006, we're 11 years later, and we've got a data on a clinical trial. So the clinical trial was, first of all, we've got two periods of 12 weeks. We've got people with a form of multiple sclerosis called secondary progressive MS. In the first 12 weeks, we simply are collecting urine samples from these individuals to confirm or not that people with this form of MS excrete more aluminium in their urine. In the second 12 weeks, they are asked to include in their everyday diet a silicon-rich mineral water. And we want to see whether or not we can get aluminium out of their body. Yeah? How much silicon-rich water do they drink? So, how much silicon-rich mineral water are people drinking each day? In the Alzheimer's study, it was at least a liter a day and up to one and a half liters, and it's exactly the same here. So we recommend that. How do they drink it is largely left to them. We prefer if they drink it as water, as opposed to using it to make drinks or anything of that sort. But most people who take part in the trials, first of all, do drink it as water, and if they don't, they keep a diary of how they drink and what they drink. And if they don't drink uh, all of the particular bottle, they make a mark on the bottle and that gets left over and they move to the next bottle for the next day. So we know more or less how much they drink. But 
good compliance is usually at least a litre a day. A litre a day is no amount of water. You should all be drinking a litre of water a day anyway, just like normal. And if you're going to do that, drink one with full of silicon, for heaven's sake. Added benefits. So we've got these groups of people and we've asked them to do to drink up to one and a half litres of silicon-rich mineral water in the second 12 weeks of, their, uh, of this particular clinical trial. And this is what we found out. So it's a little bit complicated, but you can more or less see my guess. On this here, you've got aluminium in the urine. And for 12 weeks, they're not drinking a silicon-rich mineral water. And for the following 12 weeks, they are. And I guess you can see both for males and females, that they excrete more aluminium in the second 12 weeks than in the first 12 weeks. So we have two things here. Actually, this amount of urine, urine, this amount of aluminium in the urine, first of all, confirmed to us, this is the high amount of aluminium in urine. So hopefully none of us here today are excreting this amount of aluminium in our urine, this is a high amount. This is a log scale here, so you can't actually see what it actually is, but it's a high amount. But you drink a silicon-rich mineral water and you excrete even more. Chris? Yeah. Why does it look like the women excrete more before and after? Because they do. <laughs> we don't know why? We might know why. <laughs> but the truth is, and it's statistically significant, the women are excreting more aluminium than the men, both before and after. Does that mean they're actually absorbing more than a male body? It could do, yes. Or it could mean they're more efficient in terms of their urinary excretion of aluminium. It, it, it's an area, at the moment all we do is we put it out there, discuss, and in the same way as you have, and thought about it straight away. There are gender differences. In Alzheimer's disease, there are gender differences. I'm going to talk about a little bit about that in a minute. This is also uh, what happens as a comparison. So we're measuring the aluminium in a slightly different way now in micromoles per 24 hours. And we're comparing the baseline when they're not drinking a silicon-rich min mineral water with what happens at the, right at the end of the trial. And in every case, we're seeing, again, significant increase in urinary excretion of aluminium at the end while they're drinking the silicon, which mineral water. But actually what I wanted to know, not just that they were excreting more aluminium, but I would like to have seen something similar to what I saw with the Alzheimer's study that was over the 12 weeks of the treatment period that their excretion of aluminium starts to go down. In other words, we're lowering their body burden of aluminium. So the next slide, and I know it looks complicated, it doesn't really confirm that at the moment. It tells us that in some individuals by week 24, compared to week 13 when they started drinking the silicon-rich mineral water, in some individuals it's lower, in some it's the same, in some it's higher. So we see a difference here between MS and AD. Now MS people are usually significantly younger than AD people, Alzheimer's. And maybe what this is telling us is that in MS the amount of aluminium in the body is much higher than it is in Alzheimer's. And it may take much longer to actually start to lower the body burden. Yeah? If you can use the microphone, otherwise I have to repeat it. <laughs> Following up on the question about uh, women and the gender differences between women and men and the ex yeah. excretion of um, aluminum or alum al aluminium. Aluminum is good. Uh, <laughs> um, just uh, with younger people, with MS being in younger people, and I know also seems to be more frequent in women, that would make me think that there is a hormonal component that may be interacting with how the body excretes. Yeah, yes. you may be absolutely right. Yeah, And it may have something to do with the efficiency with respect to the kidney and the ability to do that. You're absolutely right. And we, we, we honestly don't know at this stage. And that's why we hope this research will be soon accepted for publication. And 
you know, people will ask these sorts of questions and go away and we'll find out more about it. But we don't, we don't have any indication, specific indication. You know, I can pontificate all night as to different sorts of reasons, but I don't know. So, as I said, we're not necessarily seeing that over the 12 weeks of drinking a silicon-rich mineral water that we're seeing a lowering of the body burden of aluminium in people with MS. Although we did in about three or four of the... Uh, how many individuals have we got there? 20, I think it is. So silicon-rich mineral waters may be an effective and non-invasive therapy for the removal of aluminium from the body of individuals with secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. Yeah. How do you define Yeah, very good question, of course. Now, I'll give you the I'll, I'll give you the sort of uh, uh, formal answer, and I'll give you an informal answer. So the formal answer would be anything above about 30 milligrams per liter, and there is a reason for that, and it is actually based on science, and that is that. Any mineral water that we have used, which is substantially lower than 30, we have not seen the same sorts of benefits. I also have a bit of a grudge against Volvic. <laughs> and Volvic is just on the limit. So, you know, when I get a chance, I just say, you know, Volvic, yeah, maybe. And other mineral water, oh yes, much better. I mean, if you go about milligrams per liter, yeah. then you see a... We see a, there is, it is not a linear dose response, which is the good question that you're asking. However, if we try to think about how this really works, in epidemiological studies on Alzheimer's disease, there has always been a weak relationship between, for example, aluminium in the water supply and Alzheimer's, an odds ratio of maybe 1.5 or 2 or something of that sort, a weak relationship. If you look at silicon in potable waters and Alzheimer's disease, there's quite a beautiful inverse relationship, such that it's an odds ratio of about 4 or 5. So high silicon, low instance of Alzheimer's. Now, in most potable waters, they are not silicon rich. These are unusual waters. They come from certain types of geology, geochemistry, volcanic regions and other regions like that. What happens is the silicic acid is in the water, goes into your gut. It's immediately absorbed with the water into your bloodstream and you get a pulse of high concentration of silicic acid in your blood. We believe that high concentration of silicic acid is absolutely imperative to drag the aluminium out. Lower amounts are much less efficient. So in theory you produce some benefit from lower silicon, but if you want real benefit in shorter periods of time you need the high silicon and that's where the cutoff is at somewhere around 30 ppm, 30 milligrams per liter. I think about volcanic regions in the world, the Azor Islands, the Hawaiian Islands. Mm. My mom's from the Azor Islands, and we see very, very low amounts of Alzheimer's disease. Mm. So I'm wondering if they're luckily to have a protective effect here because of the water supply. If that's, you know, maybe I'm giving you another study. I don't know. But no, but you, you, you're, you're absolutely right. And one of the countries with the lowest incidence of one of the developed countries with the lowest incidence of Alzheimer's disease is Japan. I think most of us will be quite aware that Japan is a pretty volcanic set of islands, you know, and they have really high levels of silicon in their natural waters. So there is a relationship. Actually, the silicon-rich mineral water that we use in our clinical trials comes from Malaysia. And if you believe the data, and I don't always believe the data that's thrown at me, Malaysia has a really low instance of Alzheimer's disease as well. I don't know if that's true or not, but the Japanese data I can believe because you know, it, it, it's more robust. But you're right, there is a geographical relationship. Yeah. Okay, I don't want to keep you too long, but urine is a good way that the body gets rid of aluminium. 
But it appears that sweating might be just as effective. So your perspiration may well be the best way in which you are removing aluminium from your body. Because we're able to show that there's really a huge amount of aluminium in sweat. Now, just by sitting here drinking wine, those males are, are actually producing twice as much sweat as you females. Which means that females may not be predisposed to removing aluminium in their sweat in the same way as males are. Whether that also explains why females have a higher instance of diseases like Alzheimer's, we don't know. What we now know, and this is unpublished again data, which hasn't even been submitted for publication, is when you drink a silicon rich mineral water, first of all, you drink a silicon rich mineral water, this is the amount of silicon in the sweat, females and males, and this is what happens when you drink the silicon rich mineral water. So we're seeing silicon in your sweat. It's coming out in your sweat. What happens to the aluminium? We see exactly the same thing. So drinking a silicon rich mineral water is getting rid of aluminium in your urine and it seems to be facilitating the removal of aluminium in your perspiration, in your sweat too. So it could well be that there are, is a double advantage of that particular type of therapy. So, you can live, I believe, safely in the aluminium age, but you have to look after yourself because no one else is going to look after you.